Moving on. Hey there, you little stinkers. It's time for the Nintendo News Roundup. I have rounded up all of the Nintendo news, and I'm here to say it out loud with my mouth to you into your ears. First up, I don't know why I keep reporting on characters being added to Nintendo's mobile games. I, um, it's not really that important. I don't even really care about <laughs> the mobile games, and I also, like, I don't intend on reporting about every single little bit of news about every single individual game Nintendo puts out, and yet for some reason I just find myself amused by these characters. I, I don't know what it is. Especially, especially this gold dry Bowser. Any, like, any number of adjectives you can add into the front of a traditional character. Now you got Bowser and dry Bowser and gold dry Bowser. That's just funny, right? It's just funny. I'm hoping next we get pink gold dry Bowser. That will be my, uh, my main. I don't know, is that what you call a, <laughs> if it's a kart racer, you call it your main. I don't know. So as we talked about recently, they've been hard at work building Super Nintendo World in Japan. And so now, I mean, you know, they're building stuff higher and higher. And so now we are getting a slew of people just snapping pictures and taking videos, kind of just <laughs> poking up over the walls, and so everybody's just trying to glean as much information as they possibly can. So there are a lot of really, really cool things to see here. Um, we see a sand pyramid and like a flagpole and like a, uh, my my very favorite out of all of this is this little bit of Bowser's castle sticking up. It's just very cool. Like, I don't know, we've seen these things in games so much, so actually seeing a physical representation of it in real life that you might be able to get to see and touch it is very exciting. It, it, it really is uh, connecting with that, that little, you know, it's touching my nostalgia bone pretty good here. 3D World style seems to be a pretty common one here. Uh, you know, here you can even see like the clouds that you can jump up through. I do love how this is framed by what I presume is a, is a different set in the park. What, I don't know, is this like Mad Max or something? <laughs> like this like rusty scaffolds and chunks of metal all pressed together and then right behind it Oh, it's Super Nintendo world look at Mario jumping along and and uh, you also get to see um, Someone took a video of rotating coins. How cute is that? How cute is that? You look up you see coins What do coins do? They rotate. It's adorable. So um, yeah, the, these uh, over the course of a couple of days, a lot of these came in. So I'm definitely keeping my eye out for more interesting ones. And if we get any more, I will certainly share them with you. So the ongoing saga of Nintendo accounts being hacked continues. Uh, sometime back, I reported on Nintendo informing us that about 160,000 Nintendo accounts had been hacked into. People are most commonly hacking in just to spend a couple hundred bucks on V bucks for Fortnite just seems to be like the most popular thing to steal, I guess, the easiest to get away with. And Nintendo just confirmed that approximately 140,000 additional NNIDs have been accessed maliciously. It sounds like they are taking some steps here. Uh, according to this, it sounds like passwords for these accounts have been reset and account holders have been contacted, um, but we're still seeing a tremendous number of people. I mean, you even look at articles about this, look down in the comments, you see people all over the place whose accounts are being hacked and money is being taken from them. In some cases, Nintendo or some other party will refund the money. Other people are saying, no, no one's refunding my money. I can't get my money back. And it's like almost sort of a little more understandable that the security problem lies with uh, much older Nintendo accounts. Uh, you know, maybe ones that people activated around the Wii U or the 3DS or something, but Still, I maintain that Nintendo is not handling the situation very well. Why are they being hacked by the hundreds of thousands? They're, I mean, with most companies, with most services, even if you don't manually enable two-step verification, which is what Nintendo is saying you should do, that's how you, how you protect yourself, even if you don't do it yourself, no matter what, if someone tries to access your account from an uh, unfamiliar device, they will stop any of those transactions. They won't let them get in. They will contact you and make sure that this can't happen. Happens to me all the time. I mean, all the time. I get emails being like, hey, somebody got your password on some service or another. We didn't let them in. We stopped this from happening. 
Go and change your password. So I must say, this is strange. Nintendo just coming in, oh, uh, by the way, another 140,000 accounts have been hacked. So yeah, if you haven't done the two-step verification thing, yeah, you should probably do that now. So like, what's next? <laughs> How many more hundreds of thousands of accounts are gonna get hacked? I don't really know. I technically don't know enough about the situation, but it does seem a little weird. A little weird that they're not doing something on the back end to completely prevent this from happening. Also, how are people even getting these passwords in the first place? I don't really know. So we've talked about Switch uh, console shortages in recent times. You know, they make a lot of sense for various reasons, you know, manufacturing issues, and of course, just very, very high demand. Um, but one of the more surprising shortage stories that we've seen is Ring Fit Adventure. Even after all this time, it is still remarkably difficult to get your hands on a copy of Ring Fit Adventure. And uh, fortunately, it does seem like some retailers are finally starting to get them back into stock. Uh, Nintendo Life uh, reported that Game has got some stock. Uh, when I click the link, I see that there is a button to order, so it looks like they still do. Although, uh, for the US, any retailer I go to, I've tried Best Buy, I've tried Amazon, still can't find any. But if it's true that they are starting to trickle back into retailers, then I will say that is very good news, because this thing is just... <laughs> apparently a much, much bigger success than any of us could have possibly anticipated. And uh, that's pretty cool. Oh, I need to get back into Ring Fit Adventure. I'm still still carrying a little bit of that, uh, that winter weight. And uh, it's June, S still, still there. So I, I think I should prob probably, probably boot it back up again. Moving on, in a recent interview, Monolith Soft studio head and Xenoblade Chronicles creator Tetsuya Takahashi expressed interest in working on some sort of smaller scale game that wasn't necessarily tied to the Xenoblade series. Saying, I would like to do a smaller scale project if the opportunity arose, but right now I think we should focus on increasing the value of the brand that we have created with the Xenoblade Chronicles saga. It sounds like in order to manage smaller projects, uh, the design team would have to kind of organize itself differently within the company. I think it's an interesting idea and I can certainly see where he's coming from. I mean, they work almost exclusively on these big, giant, huge, epic games. And even when they're like helping Nintendo make their own games, they, you know, working on Breath of the Wild, all these like big open world games, I can totally understand the desire to work on something just a little bit smaller. And I would certainly like to see that happen. I love the idea of any company within Nintendo working on multiple things, you know, bigger projects, smaller projects, something just different, you know, just kind of new. Obviously, I don't know what's going on within the company, um, but it is, it's a little frustrating hearing something like this because it's kind of like, oh man, you, you don't think you could take like just a few, just a handful of your core guys and maybe like hire in a couple extra people to kind of form a separate team, like, I mean, you know, it wouldn't be the hardest thing in the entire world, but of course, if it's not like a big priority, it's just not something they're ready to do. Obviously, if they can do it, they'll do it when it's time, but I would very much like to see that happen. And speaking of developer interviews, Animal Crossing New Horizons director Aya Kyogoku has been on something of a interview rampage recently. <laughs> Seems like every single week she does a new interview with a new publication and has uh, just a separate little tidbit that comes out. And in the latest with the Spanish outlet La Vanguardia, she reveals that she considers New Horizons a start of a third generation of the series. Looking back on the series for the mainline title specifically, I consider Animal Crossing New Horizons to be the beginning of a third generation of the series. The first Animal Crossing had no online play features. It was created under the premise that players could communicate with an asynchronous manner without an internet connection. Online functions were added in Animal Crossing City Folk and it was possible to play together even with people living in different places. In New Horizons, due to the fact that you start by not having a normal town, there are a lot of changes even if you play alone. We also added a mode called Party Play where you can play with people living on the same island simultaneously instead of doing it asynchronously like before. So it seems that she considers each generation to be marked by the multiplayer aspect. Or rather, the options in general for a player to interact with other players when they play the game. And I can see that. That's a, that's a pretty interesting way to look at it. I think myself, I 
when looking at a game's you know generations and whatnot, I consider more like the specific features and what they kind of introduce. I think that I would be more inclined personally to say that it is a continuation of the second generation. I would lump the first three games together, then say New Leaf was kind of a new direction and New Horizons is kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, continuing that. I don't know, that's just me. She's a director, she made the game, so I mean. <laughs> What she says pretty much goes. So recently a Kickstarter project was created for the Duelist wireless gamepad for the Switch. Uh, it seemed to be a pretty, pretty neat mix between a GameCube controller and a regular Pro controller seemed to be tailored specifically for Smash players playing Smash Ultimate on Switch. It seemed like a pretty cool idea and I was gonna tell you to go check it out if this seemed to be up your alley. I mean, the controller does seem pretty cool. Though, when I checked again, it seems that the project has been mysteriously canceled. The project easily surpassed its goal uh, by very much. It had a lot of time left, and yet for some reason, uh, no reason has been given. They just kind of canceled it. And, uh, I don't know. I, does that technically mean this is no longer news I should be reporting because the news that I was reporting is not there anymore? Or is the fact that it was canceled a part of the news? Does that also make it... Interesting. I don't know. I guess I thought it was still interesting. So I so I said it to you. So sue me I don't know. We'll see if they come back though or if they issue any sort of official statement or anything I'm not really sure. I don't think there'd be any legal problems here. It's just a controller So I'm not really sure this next one was a good find by Nintendo life They report that many UK retailers are guilty of inflating switch prices whenever a product is in high demand and low supply It is you know normal and expected for scalpers and resellers to increase the price. Um, but retailers themselves are supposed to never sell above MSRP. And that's kind of what's happening here. Some of these, uh, some of these switches are going for simply higher than MSRP. And in many cases, this is particularly nasty. They create bundles. Like, not Nintendo making a bundle where they put a game in the box. They will just take the box and take some games and bundle them onto the Switch so that if you want to buy the Switch, you have to buy the bundle. You are forced to buy the games even if you don't want them. I have seen this tactic myself. I remember way back when the DS released, um, my friends were trying to get DSs at Best Buy and they just started shrink wrapping a bunch of really lame games to them. It was, it was like the Madden game on DS, like the launch title that nobody wanted. And they were just, nope, if you wanna buy this, you also have to spend $35 on this Madden game. I think they were bundling two games with them actually. I'm not exactly sure what the legality is here. I can't imagine that the re or that the uh, manufacturers, you know, the platform holders would be very happy about that. Um, but apparently that's what they're doing. And uh, I guess all I can say there is no, no. <laughs> For, t no, t tisk tisk for shame or something, I don't know. It is absolutely no fun when people are not able to get a Switch or whatever they're looking for for a good price. So, I mean, these are tough times. It's already hard that some people can't get their hands on a Switch, so it's even more frustrating when they can't, you know, they could get their hands on a Switch if they're willing to pay extra money or whatever. I don't know, just a little annoying. Like give people a break here. They just want to. They just want to play their Animal Crossing. All right. So we've talked about um, you know hardware switch hacking and emulation and stuff here. This has obviously been a a very long battle between between hackers and between Nintendo. Obviously, Nintendo doesn't want anybody to be hacking their systems or you know giving people the ability to emulate games or anything like that. Uh, but recently, a hacking group known as Team Executor has made a statement kind of lashing out against Nintendo and their very, uh, very strict, heavy-handed approach to all of this. They say, of course, we are not happy with this kind of censorship that is being enforced by legal injunctions that make us out to be something we are not, a copyright infringing ring of software pirates. Our products allow the end user to make legitimate backups of their original cartridges that they can keep to themselves and play, but this is only a very tiny subset of what the SX products allow you to do. With SX, you can expand your storage capacities of your console, run Linux, Android, and a myriad of open source applications, games, and utilities. We believe many of these cases, you know, the cases of Nintendo against people like this, are based on legal scare tactics. But that is, sadly enough, to get a small vendor, often side businesses ran by enthusiasts, who does not have the financial legal capacity to fight such lawsuits in court to fold and stop their operations entirely. And really, it's a pretty nuanced issue. You know, I mean, in a lot of ways, these people are right. When you buy this stuff, it is your own property. You should be able to modify 
applied in any way that you want, but then on Nintendo's end, they just don't like the idea that people can pirate software. And like me, I mean, it's it's really hazy. I can't say one way or the other completely. It's true, there are a lot of people who are doing this to make legitimate copies of their games and, and run a lot of, you know, open source software that's not hurting anybody. But like, it it is true that these a lot of this also enables people to make copies of games they don't own or just download the software and play it so it's it's a uh... It's just a very gray area. And I'm not really willing to throw my weight on one side or the other completely. They are very much right in their statement though. Nintendo, I mean like whether or not they're right, they are being bullies about it. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's kind of the point. They are trying to bully these people into stopping even when they don't technically always have the legal right. It doesn't really matter. All you gotta do is send deceased and desists around and people who are doing this, like he said, as hobbyists, you know, they don't have lawyers, they don't have the money or the resources to fight it. So Nintendo, I mean, you know, it's the same thing as like shutting down fan projects and anything. Nintendo just throws themselves at it. Just say, hey, cut it out or maybe we'll sue you or something. And most people are just gonna stop because they're scared of getting in legal trouble. It's a very muddy topic and that's, it's a very muddy topic. <laughs> moving on. Oh, except not really moving on because we're done. Thank you for watching yet another Nintendo News Roundup. I hope you enjoyed these newses that have been uprounded, you know, upped in a sort of roundish fashion. You have a good day. I love you. Goodbye. <laughs>